I have an existential question for you. Okay. Tell me. What is a real person? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, using my history of film production, apparently a real person is not an actor, (laughs) I guess. Yeah. I only say this because, you know, when somebody says we would like real kids, yeah. like, okay, so what What do you think a fake kid is? Like, <laughs> like, hmm. It's such a generic term at this point that I try to game it out a little bit and say, okay, so when you say that, do you want somebody who isn't wooden or stiff? Or do you want mm-hmm. somebody who doesn't like turn on the minute the camera says like, hi? Right. <laughs> like, yes. Like, <laughs> so, so why don't we go with what you don't want and then we'll go from there. Because if you actually do want real people casting or street casting, that is Mm -hmm. a whole entire different process. And although clients or directors, and by clients I also mean agencies, may think they want real, real people, like real construction workkers, they (laughs) (laughs) they may not be able to deliver the message in the way that they want it to be delivered. So it's really important to know if that is the right approach. So today on the podcast, we're talking with Angela Mickey, who is the managing director of Liz Lewis Casting, a very well-known and very reputable casting company. And she is going to educate us on all things about real people casting and street casting. So we really understand Mm -hmm. how that process works. And being informed about it will only help you manage your client's expectations. So grab a drink and stick around for this real episode of Producers Happy Hour. Welcome to the Producers Happy Hour with your hosts, Sister Christian and Lawrence Lewis. We are two producers with over 20 years of experience each, chatting over drinks about what it means and what it takes to be a good producer. Join us for insightful interviews and informative show topics that will help you get through your toughest jobs, biggest production challenges, and most difficult clients. So grab a drink. You're going to need it. And let's get to it. Because making shit is hard. Difficult (laughs) clients. Oh, geez. (laughs) <laughs> that definitely rings a bell. How are you, Sister Christian? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm hanging in there as best as one can. Every time I hear difficult clients, I'm just like, oh, yeah, no. Ooh, <laughs> a little shiver it. up my just spine. Just block it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep charging forward and, you know, do our best. That's all we can do. Exactly. Well, Let's talk about real people casting. Yeah. So real people casting like 15 years ago meant having your casting director send a couple of their associates over to like Union Square with a clipboard, (laughs) (laughs) grabbing people, talking to them (laughs) about their lives to see if they were fit and interested in getting paid a chunk of money for a commercial or a music video or whatever it was. Exactly. And right now it's a little bit different. So there's a lot of things for us to take into consideration when talking about or considering real people casting or street casting, as we called it. Mm -hmm. What is it really? What does it mean? How does it work? So today we're chatting with casting director Angela Mickey. Welcome to the show, Angela. Are you uh, enjoying a cocktail with us for happy hour? Absolutely. Red wine, Cabernet. That's my cup of tea. That's your jam. Nice. And Lawrence, what are you having today? I'm having, since we're talking street casting... I'm having something called an easy street. Uh, It's a gin drink. It's one and a half ounces of gin, a half an ounce of St. Germain, a half ounce of lemon juice, simple syrup to taste. If you're fancy, add some cucumber slices and then just top it off with soda water. And it's delicious. Oh, nice. Well, I'm having what we used to call when I was growing up a wine cooler. (laughs) <laughs> so Seagram's has put out this new line of tropical, like beachy fun drinks. So this is a class. <laughs> Note the color is neon Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> lime. It is what Seagram's calls a classic uh, margarita lime drink. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Well, cheers, everyone. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. As you know, we get into a lot of topics on these episodes, and there's often a lot of external sources of information that go into detail on the things we chat about, articles, blogs, information that you need to know. And we share those links in our listeners' newsletter. 
Yes, we also share some important industry news as well, because our industry is changing faster than I can drink this Seagram's drink. (laughs) It's important for you, too. So please stay up to date with us. Yeah, if you're loving the show and everything we chat about, then head over to ProducersHappyHour.com or click the link in our show notes to sign up to the listener's newsletter. Yes, and I just want to go ahead on a serious note, let you know that we will not be spamming you. (laughs) I'm so anti-spam. We want to send you a couple of emails a month back full of helpful information from us, curated, you know, obviously. Sign up on the website and do us a favor after you get the first newsletter. Let us know what you think. We definitely want your feedback. Angela Mickey is the managing director of casting at Liz Lewis Casting Partners and has been casting for 22 years. Angela works across the board on commercials, voiceover, animation, films, TV shows, and theater projects. Angela enjoys working with veteran and up-and-coming creatives, helping to provide an individual plan to each casting process, as well as assistance with union regulations and talent payment guidelines. Mm. Angela has worked on hundreds of on-camera commercials and voiceover projects, as well as formed the Real People Division at Liz Lewis Casting. Angela, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, I forgot. We have clapping. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to the show, Angela. <laughs> That's feeding my uh, former actor a lot. So. Yeah, there you go. It's like you're on stage once again. We appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Christian's worked with you. I've worked with you. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's nice to have you on here and introduce you to our listeners. Liz Lewis, in general, specializes in real people casting. Why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of what that means? What is it? Well, it can really depend on every project's details. I mean, I have done everything from we want cool hip people on the street, as Christian was referring to, you know, who are in commercials, to people who have real medical conditions, to people who are providing mutual aid in their communities, to people who have a certain job set. Right. So every single job is different. And that's why I think the m- number one thing you want to make sure is that you have someone who's going to look at your job at your project and really to create a casting process for it specifically because Mm -hmm. there's a section of casting that is not cookie cutter. It's not Mm -hmm. I'm calling 20 agents and getting the best people in. It's really, really specific. And I think one thing to kind of keep in mind is that real people don't know why they're right for your project. And so it's our job as casting directors to help them realize why they're right for it. And hopefully your casting director will be empathetic and a good conversation with so that when they're talking to them, they're going to get those sound bites out of them that you really want versus them just kind of talking aimlessly and not really understanding the commercial process and how they can be most appropriate. Right. And so the client's desire to have a talent have an experience that is based around the creative is what we're talking about here. When I get an agency asking me for real people, I just immediately like... Okay, I sit them down. I'm like, listen, actors are real people too. Right. right? They're humans, right? <laughs> like, so just because an actor, if they've had the lived experience that you're looking for, should not disqualify them from a job. And that used to be the old myth, right? Maybe you could tell us a little bit the difference between real people casting and street casting. Well, street casting is usually us literally going on the street, grabbing people and seeing if they are interested in doing it. I've done that where I've looked for real skateboarders and I'll go to the parks in Brooklyn and we try to grab them and film them right there on the street. Real people casting, as opposed to street casting, is really almost like investigative journalism. It's Mm. here is what you're looking for and then how can I dive into those communities to try to get options. So for example, I did one where I needed to find real voters from the Kiki houses, Ooh, which is fun. really a closed community. Yeah. You know, they mm-hmm. did, they've been misrepresented so much. There's yep. a lack of trust. So I had to like go in and find a photographic journalist uh-huh. and kind of team with her and see if she would help me make those inroads. So it's a lot deeper. It's not just creating a flyer and throwing it on Instagram and saying, hey, hopefully people will smack. We do do that. <laughs> but it's also about really being proactive of getting into those communities and getting options. Right. I've definitely overpaid someone to do that and it didn't really work out. Wasn't yeah, it? don't yeah. get me started on influencer. You know, yeah. Anyway. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. There's a real methodology to this. There's like a real skill behind it. Like you said, it's not just putting up something on social media. You have to really make some inroads. I bet there's a lot of 
trust issues, right? When just approaching people. Absolutely. And so how do you navigate that? Well, and I think part of it is letting your casting director be involved from the very beginning. I think, you know, I always consider myself a partner for the producing process and Mm -hmm. whether it's comedy or beauty, but I think it's much more so the case for real people. A lot of the clients I work with that I do a lot of real people casting with, they'll bring me in when they're bidding. Like, is the schedule um, realistic? Are there any red flags here? You know, because of our experience, we're going to know, hey, you're looking for someone who, who works with a municipality. And if anyone's tried to hire firefighters in New York City, you know that that oh, doesn't gosh. happen. So, and yes. your casting director is going to give you those red flags. <laughs> or, hey, this has been a touchy topic for this group of people. You may want to speak to your client about that. Christian, you mentioned that actors are real people. Is that a possibility? Is it okay if they've had on-camera experience? Mm-hmm. Is your mm-hmm. client really wanting someone aspirational in line with their brand? Or do they really want real people? A lot of times they say they want real people, but they want someone who's going to be aspirational. Yes. Like yes. when you would go into a um, factory setting and want to interview real employees, well, you still need to go through a process of pre-screening. Mm-hmm. You have to. You can't just stick anybody on camera. No. And, and during that process, you mentioned this earlier, like getting the right story out of them uh, for the spot for what the directors are looking for. So when you're going through this process, like let's say what Christian said, you go to a warehouse and you're trying to find somebody who has a specific story. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Are you literally taking a camera down to the warehouse and somebody comes down and interviews them and kind of edges them into that story? Or how does that really work? It can be a combination. And sometimes we're on the ground right now because post-pandemic, so much is done virtually, which is yeah. both good and bad. You know, bad in the sense that I can't grab someone who's walking by me and say, hey, do you want to do this? But good because mm-hmm. you can kind of work around their schedules. Sometimes when you're dealing with the workers in the factory, they're like, I have a time frame. Yeah. I can't do this right now. But what I tend to do is really work with the director and the producer to kind of come up with interview questions to kind of highlight what they are looking for. I love that kind of interview. And it's really mm-hmm. about being intuitive. You can't just kind of go down a line of questions, like it's no. a checklist and hope that you're going to get their personality. It's really about kind of, they say something, ooh, glom on to that. What else can we get mm-hmm. out of them? So it's really about having a casting director who is empathetic and who does not have a preconceived notion of what the story needs to be, but is willing to drag right. that out of them. So no prejudgment call going into it or like, you know, you, you may have an end result that you'd like to see, but actually allowing the interview process to play out in order to get something good. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important also to have that conversation again with the client Mm -hmm. because sometimes they have this unicorn idea in their mind and it's like you're trying to find (laughs) someone who fits all the bits and pieces of what their dream scenario is. That can sometimes be to a detriment to the project. Sometimes it's good to kind of see what these people have of their own story and what can then be highlighted from there. Ah, That's fascinating. It is a lot of sleuthing. So I wanted to also talk about prep time. Like you said before, like this isn't cookie cutter casting. It's actually, um, you know, like one prep day to call 20 agents to bring in a bunch of people. You actually need prep time to do this. So how long do you feel you need to get, you know, the prep underway and to make this happen? Never enough for commercials. (laughs) Because usually (laughs) the schedules are so quick. But I think in a dream world, you want two weeks. You want a week to really be able to get your outreach out there to dig and then you want a week to be able to interview and put people together and that also allows for times for the casting director to switch tactics if for whatever reason their first parade isn't giving them the results they want you want to have a time to adjust and to switch mm-hmm. so that we can really provide what is needed and the other thing to kind of keep in mind with real people is you also have to deal with their schedules so, you know it's, right. they're not going to be so easy to be booked on tuesday to shoot on friday they have to clear their work you know yeah. things like that so having enough time between your callback slash pre-pro and your shoot day so that way they can actually be available for you if needed Have you been in a situation where you've been given a schedule and, you know, somebody wants to hire you for this, but you look at it and you're like, there's not enough time to do a proper real people or street casting? And is there a way to compress it? Or I I think I've been in a situation once, you know, the casting director saying there's not enough time, but we can go out to our regular networks of talent and see if they have any brothers or sisters or parents or mothers that fit the bill. Is that, that's kind of a cheat. I don't know if that's really... 
Well, a lot of it is staffing. It's making sure you have enough people to do it. So if I'm having to do it on a compressed schedule, you know, that old theory, cheap, good, or fast. fast. You know? right. If you're yeah. wanting it fast, it's going to be more expensive because I need to triple my staff in order to try to meet that compressed schedule. And even with that, you might have fewer options. So if I was given a full two weeks, three weeks would be amazing, but that happens. Um, yeah. If I was given that full three weeks, I might have 30 options for you. If I'm only given a week it might be seven or eight. So it's just, again, managing the expectations of your client, knowing the parameters that we're working under. So talking, for everyone listening out there, talking to a casting director about an approach early on in the bidding process is a really smart move. I remember, Brie, you mentioned firefighters earlier. There was This job was awarded, and we were supposed to interview firefighters live on Thanksgiving Day in New York City during the Macy's Day Parade. And that was the whole concept of the thing. And it was bid and bid and bid and finally it awarded. And I said, okay, great. So who at FDNY have you been talking to? They said, oh, nobody. (laughs) It's like, oh my goodness. We have two weeks or three weeks or something. I don't know. And of course, that approval to get a firefighter to be on a commercial that was going to take longer than the two or three weeks that we had. So bringing you on early is probably really important for this kind of thing. Yep. I mean, and, and New York is especially bad with that, I have to say. They want like three months and then and that's three months and they may say no. So it's it's yeah. a little rough. But again, your cast doctor will hopefully have had experience with that and can red flag that for you. So... Christian, why are locations always such a hassle in our jobs? I know. And I get all kinds of jobs. Like, here's one for you. Celebrity interview. Celebrity lives somewhere like Memphis, Tennessee Mm -hmm. or Minneapolis. So I have to find a location near their house that is for a simple interview, but it still needs to be like a loft type setting. And it needs to be on the first floor versus like Uh, on the third floor walk up. Right, right. And and the surprise, the budget does not have a proper location scout in the budget. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, I've used marketplace stuff. I've certainly used Airbnb for this, but Uh, that can be a time suck and dealing directly with homeowners is like, no thanks. It's a nightmare. And like you said, sometimes I get on a job so early, I've got to do some pre-research before I can bring a scout on Mm -hmm. or there aren't enough scouting days in the budget. Guess what? That's your job. (laughs) Exactly. And I've used those marketplaces too, but there's like a million steps between us seeing a listing that we think could work, the director loving it, but us actually seeing it in person and booking it and securing it and doing all that, it, it can just be a nightmare. Well, drum roll, please. Yes. That is where our friends at Ave come in. <gasps> yes. Ave are the first nationwide location scouting company. Ave has a huge private network and you can save a ton of time and money getting you the perfect location wherever you need it. Simply fill out a quick form. You'll be paired with an amazing location producer and you'll receive a curated report with the best location options for your project. From there, they'll handle everything from walkthroughs to negotiating your location agreements and even permitting if needed. And they'll work seamlessly with you, your location manager, or your production team, whatever you need. There are Uh no upfront costs, and they only get paid if you book the location you need, which is magical. Which is amazing. I cannot believe that part. (laughs) So please save time, money, and your sanity by adding a VAY to your producer (laughs) toolbox. Visit a VAY at A-V-V-A-Y dot com. You're not going to regret it, I promise. And tell them we sent you. Since we spoke about prep time and needing a little bit more than what the normal, you know, casting process would be, can you speak a little bit to costs? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we normally work on a weekly rate for real people Uh, casting just because it's kind of an evolving roundtable type thing. So instead of it being a day, a day, a day, um, I normally will do like a weekly rate for the two weeks. Um, And that can really range anywhere from 4,000 a week if it's really cut and dry to seven or 10 grand, depending on the parameters. Support. And then we would add on a callback fee on top of that or if the director wanted to speak to them and interview them themselves, which I always recommend. For some reason, I think a lot of times directors are like, I eh, show people who care to get the story out. But I think you want to make sure that you can connect with this person on set. And that's something that 
sometimes it's gone by the wayside and then we hear back from the production team after the shoot and they're like oh they didn't really seem to connect and i was like if you'd have that call back yeah right you would have figured this out you know sometimes i've been on these types of jobs and you know the director wants to have a series of calls with the real people talent, just an introductory call. And then maybe like ask them (laughs) a little information, a little conversation about their story, and then maybe a follow-up call. And then, you know, sometimes (laughs) it can be a little overkill and then you kind of turn them into a robot. But sometimes that is helpful to really kind of fine tune. So do you recommend that? Are you involved in that process? Or what's your experience with that kind of guidance? I think I think it depends on where you are in the process. Like, I definitely think a, a callback is good and finding out their story. If you're going to be shooting in any of their personal locations, getting that footage and stuff like that. But I think as you continue having more and more interviews, it would hopefully only be with a select few. I have had situations where, you know, they want to yes. have multiple interviews with mm-hmm. like five different options. And these are real people Before, they don't get it. Mm-hmm. And the last yeah. thing you want, you know, also being brand aware the last thing you want is someone saying yeah i was up for this blank advertiser job you know on a real people search and they strung me along with six interviews and then didn't use me you know be aware mm-hmm. people they don't they're not gonna have any problem doing that you know so i think just being judicious and respectful of their time they're again they have other priorities they work and they're not in this industry and they don't know it so you know, explaining to them why this additional interview is needed or what the objectives are of it can be helpful so they can see from a rational standpoint why they're being asked to partake. I mean, that has sparked a little bit of memory of my previous experiences where I've had uh, production should know, and this pro tip here, that it is actually working with people who are not, um, to your point, who are not actors and don't know the industry. It takes a lot more communication and a lot more work as the producer, because you're also the contact, you're the production company. So they're going to have a thousand questions. They're going to want to know their call time, you know, a week and a half in advance for childcare. You know, they're going to want to know everything. So the more, once, once they've been confirmed, the more details that you can give them, like we will pay your mileage to drive here, whatever it is, the fittings are going to happen. And that's where a wardrobe stylist is going to call you and walk you through, get your sizes. Like you have to explain it to them as you would your second cousin at, <laughs> You know, if you're if you're explaining, <laughs> you know, the entire process to somebody, like just keep that in mind. And patience is a virtue in this situation because the last thing you want them to do is get frustrated by the process and then not be the talent that you know the casting director had spent so much time finding. Um, do you find that people sometimes will turn down an opportunity like this based on brand or on a discussion with a director, or they get cold feet, that type of thing? Actually, I really baby them and kind of carry them through the process. Yes, and then but at some point, production has producer, to take over. <laughs> yeah. Um, at any point I bring my producer in, I make sure it's not like, here's a booking sheet and go right. reach out to them. But right. it's like, of let me introduce you and kind of make it, <laughs> hold their hand through it. But I think that um, what I have seen is, you know, we haven't spoken about it, but talent rate, right? that is an interesting situation with real people. So if it's SAG, how do you break down what a talent is going to make to a real people person, especially where do you get into the idea of like usage is intended but not secured and things like that? And then if it's non-union, are you paying them enough? A lot of people think non-union is cheaper. Not necessarily. Are you paying them enough to take a day off of work? Are you paying them, you know, I've done things where I've needed to find real doctors. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, they can't clear their full day. Right. You know, they need a half day and it, it needs to be enough. Surgeons, that it's exactly. Going to <laughs> pay them enough. Yeah. And so, you know, non unit doesn't always mean cheaper in the real people world. I know. I mean, exactly. Like, I mean, I can't say enough about how non union does not always mean right. cheaper. Yeah. It has got to be enough to entice them to take all these calls and do all these things and also get the time off of work, mm-hmm. not just how much they'll make in the day, but all the extras that come along with it. That's right. It's really interesting. So, that is a surprising thing about real people casting. Are there other things that you find? producers or directors or production teams are surprised about 
when they start going through this process for maybe their first time? Um, I think the primary things, like I said, is just schedule and kind of how quickly people respond. I think, you know, if you're used to working on a regular commercial production schedule, it's mm. very quick. And especially, I don't know about you guys, but for me, since the pandemic, it seems like schedules are truncated even oh. more, you know, and things are happening even more <laughs> quickly. And there's limits that you can do with real people casting. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, you know, do you want five options? Do you want 30? Yeah. Schedule accordingly. <laughs> and who who answers their phone anymore anyway? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, seriously, though, like we're in production, we're trained to like be on our phones 24 hours a day, right? In this industry, mm -hmm. because that's how we get work. It just takes time. So that's a very good and interesting um, thing to make sure that our listeners know. I think because people think, oh, everybody's online, then mm. they'll they'll see everything. But there's so much content out there now. It everything gets drowned out. You know, I my inbox is flooded and there are things where I'm like, I don't know who that is, I'll look at that later and that later maybe a month from now. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a digging, it's repetitive contact. It is all almost like spamming them, <laughs> Christian, like you said, yeah. to try to get yeah. a response and get them interested. Mm -hmm. Finding out, okay, this person who do I know somebody else who knows them? How do I get yeah. into them that way? Like a, so, a, a low level of stalking. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little stalking. It's thing in stalking. <laughs> That's the title of this episode. I want to ask about yields. We talked about this. Christian, you said, do you want five people or do you want 30? And Christian and I kind of pontificated over two different made-up casting scenarios in our last podcast of last year. I think it was 309, our question and answer one. And we were saying, for example, if you're doing a, a comedy spot, with, you know, family of four, you're going to have fewer people in a day of casting versus a catalog lifestyle, no dialogue. You could see 50 people in a day and you maybe only see 15 people on a scripted thing. How is that affected by real people casting? Some days I imagine you might hit a jackpot and some days you may only come back with like three people. What are the variables there? Well, and that's how we tend to do weekly. So what I will usually do is, let's say I was brought on for two weeks, I would have two pitch days. I'd have one pitch day the first Friday, and then a final pitch day the second Friday. So you're still getting, hopefully, 30 people per, okay. per pitch, 30 or 40. But again, it's going to be depending on what it is. If it's super specific, I'm looking for this, somebody with a disability who does a sp certain activity that might not be there yeah. might not be 50 right. people that might be much more specific. So, you know, we'll hopefully try to manage numbers and the expectations on that at that initial consultation so that you can go back to your yeah, client okay. and calm them down and let them know what to expect. And we'll always do a check-in. I usually do a check-in halfway through the week before the first pitch and say, hey, this is, you know, we're getting a good response or, you know, here's a red flag that's showed itself. Oh, shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I've been on the receiving end of that call. It's like, people don't really want to do it. And you're just like, should we offer more money? And it's not about yeah. money sometimes. It's actually about finding the right person and the right personality to get it, right? Definitely been in a situation where, you know, even though we kind of said, hey, you know, real people would probably get less than what you're used to. And instead of coming in weekly at the end of the week and saying, here's everybody we got this week, it was happening daily. And some days they'd come back with two people and everyone would panic oh my gosh, what are we going to do? This is not enough. How's this going to work? And I'm like, this is, this is, you know, this, this these is, are actually two really we've good been people. We've talking about this the whole time. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah, so I think setting of those expectations is really important. And I think you can get into an issue, especially with your ad agency of micromanaging, if you're showing them on a daily basis, because <sighs> then they're like, are they doing work? What are they doing? You know, And, and it's like, that's why I, I say two pitch days. I'm like, you don't need to know what I'm doing on the day of the day. That's going to drive you insane because a lot of it is follow up. And again, it's like investigative journalism. Right. It's convincing them to be in. No, yes, this is just an interview. You're not committing to anything yet, you know, and having that. And then the interviews are often a lot longer than what would be in a casting totally. session if you were doing the scene. And so uh, before I even get to the list of questions that we, you know, had agreed on asking. Um, and that's another thing to kind of keep in mind, managing expectations as to what they're going to see. Because sometimes they're used uh, to mm -hmm. seeing two minutes of video that's three takes of well the script. <laughs> This is a five minute interview. Right. <laughs> and yes, we can edit, but then that slows our process down even more. So you need to cut that something to kind of keep in mind as well. And I and I also think that some people don't realize that every submission that comes in or every interview you do is not necessarily 
shown to anybody because they either didn't work or they're not right for this. So often enough, casting directors will not send everything Mm -hmm. either. Otherwise, you're muddling through a bunch of mud let's call it, slogging through the mud when um, you trust your casting director to send you the best candidates of who they've curated for you. That's what casting directors do. Yeah. Trust trust the people you hire to do their best work. Right. So to wrap it up, I mean, I, I, I think we've covered a lot of this, but like... Um, what do you feel are some like really good takeaways for those producers out there who um, are interested in getting better <laughs> <laughs> at managing expectations when it comes to real people casting? Um, we said communication, right? And this coming up with a plan early in the process. Yeah, I, I think communication, coming up with a plan, communication, making sure there's transparency and encouraging that. You know, I know that sometimes as a casting director, I weigh how busy my producer is, how much I want to be bothering that because I am just one department that you guys are dealing with. (laughs) But, you know, having guidelines of when to communicate, (laughs) whether it's, you know, okay, let's have a touch and call at 5 p.m. on Wednesday and just see how things are going. Or are you hand-holding them every day, right? Exactly. The daily update because they have a client to manage. Exactly. And also, you know, taking a second in whether it's just speaking to your casting director or taking a second on your own to really research the communities that you're looking to cast real people in and so that you can see if there's any red flags and that might Mm. come up with what your product is or what the approach of it is i mean a lot of times we look at people that really want to know how is this going to be presented if there's issues about inspiration Mm. that's a big issue Mm -hmm. that's a red flag for a lot of people these days and we know from from production standpoint yes of course we want to create something inspirational but a lot of times the subjects have a lot of hang-ups about that so it's making sure we're presenting the the material to them in a way that they want to transparent honesty wow Mm -hmm. amazing I would say that that could be a very uncomfortable thing if a talent feels that they have been misled oh. once they come to set. I mean, that would be a nightmare. So that's a great point. Yeah. Transparency and honesty. Wow. There's a lot yeah. to this. Transparency, honesty, and communication. Yeah. Those are, there you go. <laughs> kind of how we produce. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sounds like a, a beautiful relationship if you can nail all three of those. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, thank you so much uh, for having a drink with us today and filling us in on the real people casting. And you guys do more than real people casting. I don't want to sell this, Lewis, short. You do it all, theatrical, commercial, Mm -hmm. feature films. So we're excited to have you on here. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they wanted to work with you or learn more? You can reach me at my email, which is Angela, A-N-G-E-L-A, at LizLewis.com. L-I-Z-L-E-W-I-S. L-I-Z-L-E-W-I-S. Like my last name. Exactly. <laughs> Christian, how do people get a hold of you? <laughs> Not being a Lewis, yeah. you can get me through sisterchristianproduces.com. <laughs> and Lawrence? This is the Lewis part. LawrenceTLewis.com. That's where you can find me. Thanks, everyone. Producers Happy Hour is brought to you with the help of the handsome Christopher Daniels, who is a design and branding specialist, and Brendan Russell at podlad.com, who is our fabulous editor. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to dive deeper, subscribe to our listeners' newsletter. Simply go to producershappyhour.com to sign up. Thanks for listening, and remember, enjoy happy hour while you can. Because making shit is hard.